G'day Crypto Goers, I'm Adam Stokes. Welcome back onto the channel for the Crypto Sunday Summary, this being the 20th of August 2023, where as always a free and easy way of supporting this work is by simply hitting that like button, subscribing if you're new, ensuring you also knock that notification bell so you never miss a new episode. Also watch out for the bots in the comments below, I will never ever ask you to contact me via Telegram or WhatsApp, they are scammers. Please stay away. A very special shout out to my Patreon supporters, Malcolm from JustWheelieBins.com.au, Michael Dunford of Monash Glass, Lee Perry, Darren Carter from Endura Flooring Extra, Gary from the Hive Cardano Stake Pool, and Carly McEwen from Carly McEwen Coaching. Thank you for your support, it's very much appreciated. Okie dokie, let's get into it. Looking at the heat map, and although we have green across the board, let's not sugarcoat this, it was a brutal week. An absolute bloodbath, but now we've found, it appears just for now, don't want to speak too soon, a bit of a bottom. We've got Bitcoin at 26,187, Ethereum at 1672, BNB at 217, XRP hitting that 52 cent mark, Solana at $21, Dogecoin at 6 cents, with ADA at 26 cents. Over to the Fear and Greed Index, and we can see the market is scared. We are at 37, showing fear. Yesterday it was at 39, so we're on a downwards trajectory, noting this is a lagging indicator. Last week we were at 54, and last month we were at 50. So we can see that we were tracking sideways for so long, a lot of pressure, there was a breakout. Now that breakout went down, of course, not up. But it did show that after pressure and pressure and pressure in that channel for so long, it had to go somewhere and it went down. Many of you may be stressing out thinking, damn, I can't believe it broke down. Others, the veterans are like, you beauty, I got some cheap crypto. So of course, many of you are sticking with your dollar cost averaging plan. That would mean that you got some cheap crypto, whatever coin you're in over the last week. It would also mean that it gave you some breathing room to get some more Satoshis or whatever you're trying to stack, getting ready for the crypto summer. It is not the summer yet. It's barely the spring so when these markets drop down it is a matter of perspective that is were you going to sell your crypto this week anyway and if you weren't what does it matter if you have a long horizon view on what you're going to do in the crypto land then these little dips or big dips aren't something to stress about they're in fact something to embrace because fundamentally nothing has changed in crypto you might look at the reasons why this happened and of course the market was spooked with spacex selling off some of its crypto there was of course the evergrand saga which was happening for a while but we've had bigger things happened in crypto before and this dip is in fact the biggest sell-off we've seen from the ftx saga and going off the top of my head i think that entire ftx saga lasted about 67 days and then we're back to where we were and cracking on as usual in the big picture nothing has changed the only thing that you need to consider is what do you do when it dips do you sell at a bottom as the chumps do or is that the time to buy and stick with your plan or just stay with your dollar cost averaging or buying the dip noting that we are still completely on track to where we want to go Let's head over to the technicals so we can see exactly what happened and where we're going. So you're currently looking at Bitcoin to US dollars in daily candles. We have a long channel that's tracking sideways here. This is the channel I've been talking about for many weeks where nothing has really been happening. And we've been saying, well, Bitcoin is quite boring and it's not boring anymore. Something happened where you had this massive, huge candle that we just dropped out of the channel. So compression 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 then breakout but that breakout was downwards and over the week i was doing some ta and the charts were actually talking to us so let me just show you in a trend line here so we're going to draw a trend line from here to here and then another one from here to here now beyond compression we can actually see that is a descending wedge. So the charts are actually telling us this in fact could happen. And if you go a little bit more granular, you can in fact see there was another compression triangle forming here. So you kind of have two, you have a big one going from here to here and then another one within that. So you have a descending wedge within a descending wedge. So the charts were in fact actually talking to us, but again, the charts only reflect the movement of the price. TA can only give you so much. It's not because there was this long sideways channel and descending wedges that caused the breakdown. The main thing we can see is Evergrande and SpaceX happening at the same time. That is Evergrande, a massive financial, primarily real estate company in China, is filing for Chapter 11 protection or bankruptcy. We knew this was coming, but it's finally been formalized. And equally, SpaceX sold off just under a bill worth of Bitcoin, and of course, Elon Musk only has to sneeze the word Doge or Bitcoin and the markets react. Both those things happened at the same time. Concurrently, 
in crypto, anything can happen. The charts were talking to us. September is coming up. Why do we talk about September? Because typically or statistically, we talk about September being rectember. Yes, we're a bit ahead of the schedule with 10 days away until we see the month of September. The good news is October is typically a rocktober where they pump back up. But because we have the halving coming up as well, it's kind of the calm before the storm. We finally got some support here at the $26,000 mark. We seem to have found a bottom as as you can see in this area here but it did wick off with a data set that i've got in front of me as low as twenty five thousand two hundred and forty four dollars and i heard on some exchanges it dropped just below that twenty five thousand dollar mark but because there is so much buying pressure it's very difficult for it to go much lower than twenty five thousand dollars again in crypto anything can happen but ultimately the charts are showing us the charts are showing us that the market appears to have found a bottom for now so where to from here? Well, when in doubt, pan out. And we're going to do that right now. What I see in the area that we're talking about, which is just here, is a massive Bart Simpson head. Pretty wide, not so deep, which is probably a good thing. But ultimately, you could squeeze a Bart Simpson head in there perfectly. And you can see it's kind of going back to this line of support as I bring up another trend line here. If we go to where we are now, I want to count that wick off. Because remember, that wick going as low as 25 grand it goes from here to all the way back to January at the beginning of this year. Geez, that seems like so long ago. And then crossing straight through. You really want three points for confirmation, but I'm actually quite focused on this point there and this point there. Look, two points are a trend, three points of confirmation. But ultimately, will Bitcoin go lower than $25,000? Well, it depends who you ask. If you're speaking to a Bitcoin hater, it's going to zero. If you speak to other coin maxis, it's going to 10 grand. I don't think that's going to happen but of course it's crypto anything could happen but the proof is in the pudding with the buy orders and the support out there basically what we've done is we've drained the swamp of all of these leverage positions all of these people that were going too long with too much leverage they've been flushed out of the system and what we've got in return is the long-term hodlers those who are buying the dip, institutions that are scooping it up, and how convenient just as BlackRock could have their ETF approved that they get a nice little dip. Chance or coincidence? I'll let you decide. So exactly how bad was it? As you know, I normally do biggest gainers and losers at the end of the show, but I'm actually going to get into the biggest losers right now because it was a bloodbath. And let's see what happened. So the biggest loser over the week that was after everything that's happened was my old mate Litecoin that's gone down 22.7%. That's it. It's a big coin at position 15, but number one in the biggest losers, currently priced at $64.13. It's had a bit of a recovery over the last 24 hours, up less than half a percent. But over the week, down 22.7. You then have Roll Bitcoin down 21.6. Our old friend Shiba Inu, you're down 21.4. Uniswap down 20.9. EOS, you're down 19.3. Remember, these aren't really big coins. Litecoin, position 15, old school, kind of a stable coin, doesn't really do much. It's not a stable coin by definition, but I'd like to call it a bit of a stable coin because its price fluctuations aren't that much. With the exception of this week, because again, in crypto, anything can happen. Rollbit has pulled back because it was in the biggest gainers for two weeks in a row. Shiba Inu, well, ranked at number 14, a bit of a cowboy coin out there. Although a meme coin, the developers are doing a lot of work on SHIB in the background to create a demand and a utility on the token combined with the burn function. But it was not spared from this, down 21.4. You then have Uniswap down 20.9. Not a particularly huge coin. And then we get into EOS. Old EOS, you know my thoughts on this coin. Raise so much money, $4 billion, with the most money raised in any ICO in the history of crypto. Its market cap is $654 million after raising $4 billion. So had this coin just simply taken that money, put it in, dare I say, a bank or even a stable coin and done nothing, that'd be nearly $3.5 billion ahead of where they are today. But I'm ranting. Actually, I'm going to rant a little bit more. So Wall Street memes, I released a video on that about how it's a scam. And many people have come back and said, no, no, because it's raised so much money, it's going to work. And it's like, you guys just don't get how this works, do you? You don't get it. Now, I don't mean to say that in a condescending way, but just because you raise a lot of money doesn't mean it's going to make all of its investors a lot of money. If it's a rug pull, it means those who made the coin and are going to pull the rug out from underneath you, they're going to make a lot of money. And even if you don't want to believe it's a rug pull, look at EOS. EOS wasn't a rug pull, depending who you ask, but it reminds us all, just because you raise a lot of money doesn't mean it's going to give you a lot of success. Look, dare I say, I've got to keep it balanced. Pulse is the same. 
everyone who sacrificed for Pulse, you would have been better off not sacrificing and buying after it launched. Now, of course, you can't read a crystal ball and know that that was the best move to make. But if I head straight over to Pulse now, you can see here, as I zoom in, the price of Pulse at the moment is 0.47 of sacrifice. Meaning whatever you sacrificed for Pulse, depending on the coin at the time, of course, because you could have sacrificed Ethereum or Litecoin, or I think there was, there's a whole list of coins that you could have sacrificed, and those coins are always going up and down. But ultimately, in the big picture, according to GoPulse itself, you've lost half of your money from getting in early. You would have been much better off buying now as a quantity of coins that you could obtain. And this is no dig at any project, just a sheer fact that reminds us that just because you got in early, doesn't mean you're going to make a lot of money. And this is why ICOs are so brutal. Throw in the scam coins that are out there and it's even worse. And I suggest that Wall Street memes is absolutely a scam. You know the biggest flag with Wall Street memes? Where are the founders? So I've just shown you Pulse and now I'm talking about Wall Street memes. What's the biggest difference between those two coins? Well, one has got utility and the other one doesn't. But I would argue the biggest difference between the RH ecosystem and the Wall Street memes ecosystem, is whether you like Richard Hart or not, he was constantly in front of the camera. This is me, this is my face, this is my project. Well, how many people have you seen from Wall Street memes getting in front of the camera? Who are they? Don't you think that's sus? Why is it that the Wall Street memes founders are throwing money around like candy to every YouTube commentator who will fall for their bribes? Because that's what it is. They get a bit sneaky and say, this is a sponsored video. No, 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 no. You've taken a bribe to pump a coin that's about to dump. That's not a sponsored video. That is you misleading your viewers. And I've kept a record of all of you. You're all a disgrace. I know how it worked because they approached me with the same offer. The difference between me and all those other crypto commentators that took the money to pump a scam is that I will not sell out my audience. I can't guarantee I'll always get everything right, but I can guarantee... I will not sell my soul and my brand to throw my audience under the bus so some foreign faceless entity can rip off you, my good crypto brothers and sisters. I've made copies of all the videos I could find of these prominent YouTubers shilling Wall Street memes. And when Wall Street memes does its rug pull, I will be publishing all of those videos. If I'm wrong, I'll wear it. But when you've been in this space long enough, it just becomes so blindingly obvious. And for all of you who have invested in Wall Street memes, look, again, in crypto, anything can happen. Maybe you'll get a Shiba Inu. Maybe you'll get a Pepe. Maybe you'll get a Dogecoin. More likely, you'll be speaking to your accountant to write off those losses in your tax return. And scam coin rand. Moving further down, you can see ApeCoin was the next biggest loser down 19.3%. Bitcoin Cash down 17.8%. Old Chainlink down 17.7%. Axie Infinity down 17.5%. XRP taking a massive hit. Currently at position 5 on the charts. That looks good. Trading at 52 cents. You went down 17.2%. So where do we sit, XRP Army? All right. Beat me up for telling the truth. You are in the same position as you were before the outcome of the SEC trial. And we've got news on the SEC appealing the outcome. We'll get to that a bit later. Further down, we've got Stacks down 17.1, Ecash down 17.1, The Sandbox down 16.7, and Pepe down 16.7, Carva down 16.6, Decentraland down 16.6, Bloodbath, Aptos down 16.3. Look, it's all in the red, but the biggest loser over the week that was, was Litecoin down 22.7. So that's not an 80 or a 90% drop. At the end of the day, it's crypto. And just in those price drops, I did see something that I thought was really weird. So I'm going through the news as I always do. I'm over at all the headlines. And there is this series of news articles that are coming out from BTC peers that are saying Tron slips 0.09%, XRP jumps 0.49%, Solana's 0.23%, Binance Coins 0.004%, Polygon's minus 0.09%. Why are they talking about these tiny points? Like talking about stocks in the olden days that move 0.23% or 0.04%, that's normal. But in crypto, that's not even a pulse. It's like a tiny murmur of what's happening in the background. And yet here you have all of these articles talking about movements of, here we have 0.01%. You're writing a whole article on a coin moving 0.01%. What's going on here? A price move of 5% 
is business as usual in the crypto land, but price movements of 0.01%, 0.09%, 0.04%. What's going on, BTC peers? Why are all of these articles making it into the summary of crypto news? If we go down a little bit further, these ones make more sense. Litecoin plunges 18.3%. That's a story to talk about. That's a big coin making a big drop. But you're going to write an article about Dogecoin making a 0.01% move? Man, (laughs) I think the theme of tonight is that in crypto, anything can happen, including old BTC peers writing stupid articles about nothing. And rant. That's two for tonight. Let's move on. Let's check out the biggest gainers. Could you have made any money in this market? Well, remember, you can make money in any moving market. If it goes down and you've shorted the position, you've made some money. If it goes up and you've longed the position, you've made some money. If you're buying low and selling high, you've made some money. If you're selling the picks and shovels of the tools in the background for the crypto land, you've made some money. But when it comes to the basics, buying low and selling high, the biggest gainer over the week that was, was old Brune, Thorchain, up 31.1%. Good stuff, Thorchain, well done. And then Hedera, going against the market, Hedera HBAR up 14%. We then have Injective up 3.4%, and that's it. Then we're into the stable coins, and they don't count at all. Gemini, Tether, Pax, Frax, DAI, USD coin, Binance coin, True USD. Look at these, these are all stable coins. USDD, and then Tether Gold and Pax Gold, which are arguably stable coins to the point where they're pegged to something but even the gold coins per se they've taken a hit down 1.1 percent not a huge hit but still down (laughs) ultimately what we've seen is that contrary to what old peter schiff says gold is not performing gold is not even holding its price again i'm not against gold I've got gold, but it's not the be-all and end-all. The question we're all seeking an answer to is, where do you put your money? Like, you can't put it in fiat, they keep diluting it. You can't put it in banks, because it's in fiat, and they can steal it, block it, do what they want with it. You can't put it in precious metals, because you can't move it, and it's not holding its value. Even if you say, well, it's held its value consistent with the US dollar, well, guess what? It's lost its purchasing power. So where do you put your money? The best performing asset over the last decade, whether you like it or not, is Bitcoin. Fact. Nothing has outperformed Bitcoin. Now, of course, I can hear one of you saying, no, 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 this share of this telephone shop in Sri Lanka that outperformed it by 0.5%. Look, I'm talking about global powers here. I'm not talking about Auntie Fanny's handbag shop in your local mall down in Yorkshire. I'm talking about global assets. Where do you put your money? Bonds aren't performing. Gold's not performing. Precious metals aren't performing. Oil's not performing. Forex is definitely not performing. All we've got at the moment is Bitcoin. And then below that, you can see other coins are performing quite well, such as Ethereum and ironically, some meme coins. Think about that. You want to know the absurdity about crypto? The absurdity about the financial markets? Strap yourselves in, kids. Here comes rant number three. Dogecoin is performing better than most global companies. Dogecoin is performing better than the United States dollar. Dogecoin is performing better than gold. You know that things are really weird when you have meme joke coins performing better than global reserves or powerhouse international companies. Meanwhile, as we in the crypto land outperform most, if not all industries globally, it's the normies who try to step on our neck and tell us we're the scam, we're the Ponzi scheme, we're the ones who can't be trusted. Huh, really? A shout out to our brother, Finn Bear, who told us about Oliver Anthony's song, Rich Men North of Richmond. Now I'm thinking, why on a crypto channel would old Finn Bear be telling me about some country dude singer that I've never even heard about talking about some rich men north of Richmond. Listen to the song and you'll get it. Well done, Finn Bear. And the world is sharing your support for this song and your intrigue for this song. I'd like to play it right now, but I'm sure I get a copyright strike. So just go to YouTube, Oliver Anthony, Rich Men North of Richmond. It's a short song. It's a powerful song. And it reminds us that People are waking up. Now, YouTube is exploding on this song by heaps of commentators who aren't even into music. They're talking about this representation of the man out there who's just trying to get ahead, just trying to live. And you've got all of these rich men. They want to know everything. What are you doing? What are you thinking? We're destroying the currency. The dollar ain't S. Meanwhile, we're rewarding swamp hog land whales on welfare who are glorified for being 
pigs draining resources, ironically destroying the environment whilst claiming we need to protect the environment. Meanwhile, the battler out there can barely afford to feed himself let alone his family, despite working overtime, despite everything he's trying to do. And you have this societal cognitive dissonance of those who take the most, demand the most, and those who give the most want the least. Most of the workers out there, they're just like, leave me alone. Let me go to work. I'll do my hours. I'll do my overtime. I'll even pay my bloody taxes. But can you get off my neck? Can you stop attacking me and criticizing my existence? Can you stop eroding my money, my energy, my economic output? Can you call it out for what it is and stop rewarding these blue-haired swamp donkey pigs, these entitled Karens, these ignorant soy boy cucks who claimed they are oppressed when in reality they are the most privileged species in the history of humanity? Never has the welfare state had it so damn good. Never has one group of people had more rights over other people, more handouts, more laws, more scholarships, more schools, more hospitals, more safe spaces targeted directly towards them. And what's the outcome? Men bad, give us more money, give us more taxes, and let's print more money to fund the parasite welfare state who keeps us all in poverty, who destroys nations, creates divide, and ensures economic and environmental ruin. To be very clear here, I've said it before and I'll say it again. As a nation, we have a moral and ethical responsibility to look after the vulnerable, weak, and broken people in our society. You will never convince me otherwise. Where I put my foot down, and where people are waking up, is we need to stop rewarding bad behavior. We need to stop paying and glorifying a couch walrus who's covered in Dorito dust and Krispy Kreme cum being economic, social, and environmental parasites constantly rewarded, funded, and glorified on the corpses of countless good people, men and women, who contribute to society. I've got to go to another funeral on Tuesday, another funeral. And it made me think, I can't remember the last time I went to a female funeral. This is going to get controversial. Here we go. Strap yourselves in. Rant number four. As men, we want to protect our families. We want to protect our women. We want to provide for our women. But when men are constantly stood on and trashed and belittled and ironically objectified, Send them off to war, send them off to conscription, send them down the mines, take their taxes off them. You wonder why passport bros and MGTOW exist. There's too many men just walking away or dying. I had this epiphany recently. I'm about to go to another funeral and the older I get, the more funerals I go to. But I realized I've never been to a woman's funeral. I'm not saying women don't die. I'm not saying old people don't die. Of course they do. But it was only recently when I realized I've got to go to another funeral. If it's so bad, why aren't the women dying at the rate that men are dying? Like really, why are suicide rates for men five times more than women? If we're so privileged and it's so easy and it's so great, why are we dying in droves? If we've got it so good and we're so privileged, why are 98% of workplace deaths men? How is that privilege? If we've got it so good, why is it only men are signed up for conscription? If you really want to call out a wage gap, why aren't you calling out a workplace death gap, a workplace injury gap, a workplace hours worked gap, a tax gap? You want to see the real gap? Look at the tax gap. Where do the tax dollars come from? Then if you really want to be flawed with the numbers of reality, look at the tax paid gap to the tax spent gap. Where is the majority of the taxes coming from compared to where are the majority of the taxes spent? You look at that gap which does exist, which has been uncovered through government-funded studies that they quickly had to oppress for fear of exposing their truth, then you'll see the so-called wage gap doesn't just disappear. It completely inverts. And what Oliver Anthony has said and other people are now coming to the forefront saying is like, they're dividing us for a reason. Meanwhile, we want to look after and protect the women in our society. And what do they do? Oh, men can be women now. What? And not only can men be women, but the woman of the year in pick your category is a man. <laughs> And yet if I call it out, I'm the bigot. All right, well, I thought I was supposed to protect the vulnerable. No, 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 no. Now I can go into the vulnerable spaces just by claiming I can go into those spaces. Meanwhile, 
We take the father out of the home by decimating them in family courts, which are courts that are above all other courts. They're above the high court. They're above tax laws. They're above so many laws. And the majority of those courts are about decimating the man. So you take the father out of the family who would otherwise fight and die for their family to protect them from the nonsense that we are all facing on the front lines of society. Then the next wave happens. They're now pulling the mother out of the family. Oh, you don't want to be a mum. You want to work for the government. You want to work for the man. No, being a mother and working for your family, that's derogatory, bigoted, sexist, and demoralizing. What you really want to do is give your kids to the state so they can be raised by someone else and then you can go and work for the corporation. That's glorified. That's better. Meanwhile, after we forever increase the labor pool, gender aside, when you had 50% of the workable population working, there was work pool supply one. When you double that supply by forcing women into the workplace, and don't misquote what I'm saying here. Girls, you want to work? Go for it. But wanting to work and being forced to work are two very different things. You have to work now. Because if you don't, you're broke. Well, first of all, they took the man out of the family. Second of all, even if the man was in the family, you cannot afford to have a stay-at-home mum or dad unless someone is on huge amounts of money. So now we've doubled the work pool from supply one to supply two. When you have a price for something at a set supply and then you double the supply, the price goes down. That is, your wages go down. Then you've got supply three. Open all the borders. Let in as many people as possible. Okay, so now you're in supply three. So the labor supply has tripled, which means the wage in real terms, keeping all things consistent, has dropped by two thirds. And then just when you thought things couldn't get any worse, I know what we'll do. We'll raise taxes and print more money. So now your wages are cut into a third in real terms. The tax man takes half of your pathetic wage. And then with the pittance of a wage you're left with, they dilute your economic energy and output by printing more money, not to give to you, but everyone else. Taxes are decimating you. Those who give the most are socially, financially, and economically slaughtered. Those who contribute the least are glorified, elevated, and paid. And meanwhile, we're tearing each other apart as we fight over take your pick, black, white, male, female, 300 genders, lots of different sexual preferences, left and right of politics, the vaccinated and the unvaccinated, global warming, not global warming, fossil fuels, not fossil fuels, take your pick. It's just a constant battle amongst ourselves when the core of all of it is money. Go all the way back and you'll find that when money is broken, everything around it falls to pieces and that's where we're at here. You want to know why? I talk about politics on this channel. You want to know why I talk about the danger of purple-haired swamp donkeys and carantrums that are immune from consequences and paid for bad behavior? It's because it tears down society. And Oliver Anthony, in this beautiful masterpiece, has represented the silent majority in three minutes of pure art. And everyone with half a brain or more has seen courage. They've seen the silent majority come forth and in an almost biblical manner, held a mirror up to all of us. We're now at the point that you don't even have to be a sociologist or an economist to understand something is terribly wrong. Money is broken. Society is broken. The unity of our nations is broken. And those at the very top, they'll blame the white man or the straight man or God or Putin, or Trump, or a flu, or heterosexuality, take your pick. All of it is a facade for the reality of the broken foundation to society. And that is money. Fear is the biggest scam in the history of humanity. You know it, I know it, and now others are starting to realize it. Others are waking up. The line in the song where he says, your dollar ain't shit, that epitomizes what we're all feeling. Whether you're using the dollar, the rupee, or the euro, the foundation is the scam of fiat and a money printer where those at the top get all the benefit from destroying everyone beneath them. And the top of the tree is the United States dollar. And we all scream out to America, please be fair. 
Be the leaders you claim you are. Show the morality you preach on other nations. Prove that you're the greatest nation in the world by acting with the greatest morals in the world. But so long as we see your actions of the destruction of countless people and nations globally through the endless printing of your money of war, your actions speak so damn loudly, I can't hear a word you're saying. America is a nation that can be defined in a single word. I was in the foot him, uh, foot, foot, I was in the foot him, uh, foot, foot. All men and women created by the, go, you know the, you know the thing. Over to the top crypto stories this week. First up, a judge grants SEC request to file motion for appeal in Ripple case. Wait, what? The United States government taking on an alternative to the existing bank system? Uh, let us look into it. Judge Annalisa Torres has granted a request from the United States Securities and Exchange Commission to file a motion for leave to file an interlocutory appeal in its case against Ripple Labs. The decision allowed the SEC to file a motion on August 18, requesting permission to bring a case to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. Ripple will also be able to file an opposition to the motion. Torres ruled on July 13 that Ripple's XRP token is not a security when distributed in public sales, but the ruling considered XRP a security in institutional sales. The case against Ripple has been ongoing since December 2020 when the SEC sued Ripple and its executives over allegations of offering an unregistered security. End summary there. As I was saying from day one, there will be an appeal and there you are, ladies and gentlemen. Now, to be clear, we all stand behind Ripple in this case. We stand behind them because for all the banter we give each other, at the end of the day, Ripple and the XRP army are part of the crypto community. And although we may pick on our brothers and sisters within the space, when some bully from outside picks on our brother, we step in and we back him up. And to you, Ripple and the XRP army, I have your back. Yes, part of it is because I want crypto to succeed. But most importantly, I'm sick of the centralized Ponzi scheme that decimates any competition to the fraud and corruption of fiat and every other parasite and cancer that feeds off this metastasized ball of filth, criminality, violence and war. Big words I realize, but follow the money. This case has absolutely nothing to do with the SEC claiming to protect investors and absolutely everything to do with the SEC protecting the US dollar and every financial system, institution and messaging system, aka the SWIFT network, that supports and enables the centralized, weaponized, politicized fraud of fiat. Over to a rough week in the crypto land news, Bitcoin and Ether price slump leads to crypto bloodbath with $1 billion in liquidations. The summary reads, the Bitcoin and Ether price slide on August 18 saw the top two currencies fall to a two-month low and triggered a series of liquidations for thousands of derivative traders. The crypto bloodbath led to billions of dollars worth of hedged positions being liquidated and several traders lost millions of dollars in a single trade. According to Coinglass data, a total of 176,752 traders got liquidated within hours, indicating a rapid rise in price volatility just days after BTC and ETH recorded their lowest daily volatility in several years. Think about that. We've been talking about how low the volatility has been in Bitcoin, Ethereum and cryptocurrencies at large. <laughs> And in true crypto style, hours later, we have over 176,000 traders get liquidated out of their position under extreme price volatility conditions. Once again, in crypto, anything can happen. The price function in the crypto market was attributed to several factors, including the SpaceX, Bitcoin write down and macroeconomic factors. This is just a reminder, my crypto brothers and sisters, if you don't understand trading, particularly if you have leveraged positions, you should not be in that game. So some people get really angry when I even talk about trading. Those people who get really angry about it are those who've probably been wrecked by it. But guns can be very dangerous. But if you're trained in how to use them properly, they become a lot safer. Very powerful cars and jet aircraft are very dangerous if you don't know what you're doing. But if you're trained in driving and flying those vehicles properly, you can reduce your risk. And trading is the same thing. It can be deadly if you don't know what you're doing. And most of you don't, which is fine. Stay away from it. 
But if you want to learn about it, start low. Low amounts, low or no leverage on low volatility coins and get a feel for it. You can even use sites that you're just doing it on real numbers, but with fake money. That is, you set up practice accounts, which is what you should all do. Even if you don't want to trade, it's still good to understand it. That's kind of my approach to everything in life. Even if I don't want to do certain things, I like to learn about it. That's why I love certain shows that talk about industry or history, documentaries on past, present, and future. I don't necessarily want to be a coder on blockchain technologies, but I like to know about it. I don't necessarily want to be a drag car driver, but it's interesting to know about the physics behind it and the power of those engines behind it. There are many things that are happening around the world that I may not necessarily want to do, but it's still helpful to know how it works. Carpentry, electrical engineer, plumbing, mechanics. These aren't things I necessarily want to do for a living, but I have a basic understanding of all of it, and I'm interested to know how it all works. For you in the crypto land, noting that a lot of the prices are affected by traders, you may like to know the mechanics behind it. It's the same with crypto mining. I openly share this regularly. When I first got into crypto mining, I spent tens upon tens of thousands of dollars setting up mining rigs and then paying the subsequent electricity bills. Financially, mathematically, I would have been much better off not doing any of that and simply buying Bitcoin and holding it. Absolutely hands down, particularly if I got some Ethereum as well, I'd be in a very, very good position. But the truth is, I'm now a veteran crypto miner and the expertise I have in mining and understanding the mechanics of the back end to the biggest cryptocurrency in the world puts me in a very good position to understanding, debating and communicating the pros and cons of a proof of work system over proof of stake. I could tell you what it's like to drive a car for years, but until you actually get behind the wheel, you'll never really understand. You could apply this to many things, flying, walking, loving, creating, building, pick your verb. It's one thing to know the theory behind it. It's another thing to know the practice of it. And just on a little bit of a leadership tangent, I've said for decades that there is an art and a science to command or being in charge. The science is management. The art is leadership. And that's why I believe that a true leader is born and not created. And I substantiate that with the fact that I could send a thousand people through the best leadership school in the world and they could all have the same teacher and the same curriculum and there will be better leaders than others at the end of that course, irrespective of the same teachings that they went through. The art and science of any topic or skill is prominent throughout all mankind. For example, you could teach me to paint for 20 years, and although I may be able to master the science of painting, I'm never going to have that true natural artistic ability, because that's just not me. It's the same with dancing. You could teach me how to dance for years, and I may understand the science, but I'm not going to be a master of the art. And the same is true with the art of command. I can teach you how to give annual reports, monitor your staff, set parameters and lead by example, but I can't teach you charisma, inspiration, motivation and truly balanced deliberation. All of that is an art. I bring this back to trading. There is a science and there is an art. And where so many people get it wrong, in my opinion, is that they only focus on the science of trading. They show you charts with squiggly lines all around it. And they say this coin will be the best because it's got a good back end. But they refuse to teach you the art. What's happening in the bigger space? What is the emotion of the markets? What is the political stance of this government in this location at this time? All of these bigger picture components of trading are the art of trading as opposed to the science of trading. This is probably a beautiful segue into my book, 28 Pro Trader Tips. The art of trading, where I try to teach you, the investor or trader, these are the things that you need to consider outside of Bollinger Bands, Fibonacci retracements, ascending wedges and bull flags. This is the psychology of trading, the humanity of the markets, because behind every trade is a person and behind that person is an emotion. And after that emotion, you have an action and that action is ultimately a buy or a sell. Over to El Salvador, where Bitcoin-friendly El Salvador sees bond returns soar to 70% in 2003. 
The summary reads, El Salvador, which adopted Bitcoin as a legal tender in 2021, has seen its dollar bond outperform the majority of the emerging markets with a 70% return in 2023. The massive rally of the bond has now drawn interest from several institutional giants, including JP Morgan, Eaton Vance, and PGIM Fixed Income, prompting President Nayib Bukele to say, quote, I told you so. Apart from the institutional giants, the likes of Lord Abbott and COLLC, Newberger Berman Group LLC, and UBS Group AG have also added debt security since April. El Salvador paid $800 million in debt in full within the due maturing time at the start of this year, raising confidence in the country's bonds again. Let's just break this down. What does it all mean? First of all, this country has paid off its debt. It paid off its debt. And it did that by backing its bonds, its legal tender. Hang on, go back a step. It did that by incorporating Bitcoin into its legal tender as opposed to being at the mercy of the US dollar. So El Salvador doesn't have a native currency. It uses the US dollar. So it's at the mercy of what a foreign government is doing with the tender within their own country. What a nightmare. Many countries do this, by the way. What El Salvador did, and Old Bukele, is that he enabled Bitcoin to be legal tender within his own country. And he even started off by, I think I gave from memory, about $30 worth of Bitcoin to every resident everywhere. Now, he's doing many things right in this country, but ultimately what he's done is he's stepped outside the norm and he's paid off his debt. And countries just don't do this. I mean, hang on, let's go back to the biggest country. The United States of America never aims to pay off its debt. Trillions upon trillions of dollars in debt and now they're at the point where they just print more money to pay the interest on the debt, not to pay off the debt, just to keep the lenders satisfied for now. But the lenders aren't satisfied for now because they keep paying them with a diluted money. And that diluted money has little value. And moreover, they don't want to lend them more money. So little old El Salvador has in fact shown the world, hey, this is what happens when you adopt a Bitcoin standard. This is the consequence. The consequence is we come out ahead. And we can pay our near billion dollar debt in full, raising confidence in the country's bonds. Now, you might say, oh, Adam, $800 million isn't much. It is for El Salvador, a nation that can't even afford to have its own currency. They've paid off, and and that's US dollars, so that's easily a billion Australian dollars. They've paid it off. And they did it since changing their financial system just two years ago. What does that tell you? Meanwhile, the IMF is cracking down on countries who want to break away from the drug of the US dollar. Now remember, loans that are loaned out to poorer nations from the IMF, they're not using gold, they're not using Bitcoin, they're using, what do you think? The US dollar. So what's the advantage of lending out money to other countries in the US dollar? It creates a greater demand on a money that has an unlimited supply. Supply versus demand 101, as long as the demand goes up consistently with the supply, price will hold steady. As long as that demand and supply curve consistently move together to the right in unison, price will hold steady. When you have a decoupling of this movement, which we're seeing, the supply curve is rapidly sliding to the right and the demand curve is rapidly sliding to the left. That means the purchasing power of the US dollar is plummeting through the floor. And countries that are breaking away from it now, whether at the low end of the wealth spectrum or at the high end of it, Everyone stands to gain from adopting the Bitcoin standard, except for, have a guess, the United States government. This is why the US government must fight Bitcoin. When I speak on other channels, they approach me as if they've had some incredible breakthrough. Oh, Adam, I put it to you that the United States government won't allow Bitcoin. (laughs) What? Duh. Of course, they will do everything in their power to try and stop Bitcoin. But what the brilliant interviewer and the fake money addicted fail to realize is that the US government and every government, they have no choice. You have no choice. It's like saying, I'm a military who won't adopt jet aircraft because we like biplanes. You have no choice. You will be wiped off the face of the earth. Oh, no, no, we're not going to use torpedoes in the ocean because that goes against the design of my wooden sailing ships. Good luck with that, military. Oh, no, 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 no. We're against a nuclear arsenal, so we're not going to make nukes. Too bad. You have no choice. You have to adopt this. 
you can no longer bully the global population with your indebted and unmotivated military against superpowers globally. Story time with Uncle Adam. I'm constantly listening to YouTube videos, constantly. And there's one, I, I won't mention the name of the channel. It's very good. It does a lot of scenarios. And some of the scenarios are imaginary, like, you know, what would happen if we sent a company of today's US Marines back to fight 5,000 Roman soldiers? That was a fun one. And then it does another one. What would happen if America went to war with this nation and that nation? Anyway, they did one of America versus Russia. And it's an American channel, and it's, it does very well, but it goes... What the Ukraine war has taught us is that America would obliterate Russia within weeks if they went to war. And I'm just like, what? I unsubscribed from the channel when I heard that because I said it as a matter of fact. I put this to you. America is absolutely a superpower, the biggest military in the world. You have no debate from me there. So let's just make sure we're debating the right thing here. But you tell me how the United States alliance, which includes Australia and England and Canada and France and Italy, and I could go on. How do we all go against the Taliban, who had no nuclear arsenal, no air power, no armoured vehicles, just arguably guerrilla fighters in caves in mountains? And I don't mean that in a negative way. I mean it as a matter of fact. How do we go against that nation in 20 years? And then you come up with a statement, oh, America would obliterate Russia in a week. What? How do we go, including Australia, America, Australia, England, I could go on, against the VC, the Viet Cong, in Vietnam for seven years? Same thing, complete air supremacy, unlimited supply chain, huge amounts of troops, superior weapons. How do we go in that war? Even go back to the Korean War. How do we go against the North Koreans? Didn't win, didn't lose. It's a stalemate. It's still a stalemate. More than six decades later, we still have a ceasefire, not a peace treaty, just an agreement, okay, we're going to stop killing each other. I say this so you, you realize, not as a matter of opinion, but as a matter of fact, having the biggest military in the world doesn't mean you can win wars. How many examples do I need to give you where the superpower and its alliance cannot beat countless adversaries on their home soil? We did not beat the Taliban after two decades. We did not beat the VC after seven years. We did not beat North Korea after about three years. Very few wars are actually won. And so the claim that you can force any nation to use the US dollar, sure, maybe you can beat up little old Iraq and Libya, but how are you going to go against China or Russia or India or Iran or Saudi Arabia or all of them combined. When it comes to Bitcoin, you have no choice. I encourage you all to look at the work of Major Jason Lowry, Space Force officer, who wrote a book so powerful that his own government banned it. So he wrote a book that was banned because it stated the facts of what I'm echoing to you now. And what I've been saying for years, you don't have a choice. And he articulated it beautifully about the power of Bitcoin, in fact, being a power you can't turn your back on. Just as you couldn't turn your back on torpedoes and missiles and planes, you can't turn your back on Bitcoin. You don't get to choose what your adversary does or doesn't use. You don't get to choose. And when Bitcoin is the scarcest and hardest asset on planet Earth and your adversary or ally wants payment in Bitcoin, it doesn't matter how much of that US fiat funny money crap you print or Australian funny money crap or British funny money crap. It doesn't matter. If your ally, your customer or your adversary wants Bitcoin, you will pay in it or there's no deal. And El Salvador is showing the world we go from a poor, broken, indebted country to a leader in the financial space where massive institutions, including JP Morgan, are coming to Bukele and saying, how'd you do this? How do we get in early? My crypto brothers and sisters, there's not much time. It'll be a little trickle, then a pour, then bang, and it will come gushing in. And I'm talking about the power of Bitcoin and the collapse of fiat. Over to the crypto rankings where we have Bitcoin 1, Ethereum 2, Tether 3, BNB 4, and XRP sliding up to position 5. Well done. That's impressive. Noting that the stablecoin of USDC is at position 6. Jeez, these are some big moves over the market. We then have Lido staked Ether, massive move to position 7. Cardano at 8. 
Dogecoin at 9 and Solana at 10. We'll get straight into the dark horse for the week. I would say it's Lido Staked Ether. Some say ST ETH. I say Steth because I'm lazy. Steth is proving itself. Look, it's up to position 7. That is a huge milestone in itself. But because it integrates with the Ethereum network, there's a lot of utility around it. People are using Steth. It's got to be my crypto dark horse. Not financial advice. Do your own research. All investments come with risk. Back to the charts where we have Tron. The old Tron at position 11. Jeez, for, for all the crap that we give Tron, it's looking strong. Position 11, unbelievable. Then Polkadot at 12, Polygon Matic at 13, Shiba Inu 14, Litecoin 15, Toncoin at 16, Rap Bitcoin 17, Dai, a stablecoin at 18, Avalanche, AVAX looking good at 19, Uniswap at 20, Bitcoin Cash 21, Leo Token 22, Stellar XLM, cousin to XRP at 26, Link at 24, Binance USD, yet another stablecoin at 25, True USD, yet another stablecoin at 26, OKB at 27, it recently did audits, OKB, and those audits show that it actually has a lot of money behind it. I was nervous about OKB when I took them off the crypto land a while ago. Why? Because the company won't talk to me. They won't talk to me as a customer or a YouTuber. I cannot and will not promote a product that doesn't talk to me unless it's Bitcoin because there's no one to talk to. <laughs> Moving further down, Monero XMR at 28. Uh, I saw a clip recently where McAfee was saying, rest in peace McAfee, but he was saying before his alleged death, we can agree to disappearance that XMR would be the true power coin because of its true privacy. So we were speaking about XMR last week. It's holding steady at position 28. The late McAfee was a big believer in it. Governments have attacked it because it's so private and it is a very powerful coin. Should you get some? Nah, why not? Hold it in your bag. Cosmos Hub or ATOM, you're at 29. Ethereum Classic still in the charts at position 30. Hedera HBAR at 31. Filecoin 32. Internet Computer 33. Quant QNT at 34. Lido Dow at 35. Mandel MNT at 36. Kronos CRO at 37. Aptos APT, this is fun, at 38. <laughs> Arbitrum 39. And VChain at position 40. Over to a new segment called Movie of the Week. Let's work on that. I can't guarantee I'll do this every week because I don't actually watch that many movies, but I thought this was very applicable to our audience. So this movie is called Megan. It's on Netflix, or maybe it's Megan. M-E-G-A-N, but the E is a three. I want you to watch it. First of all, it's actually quite entertaining. It wasn't the greatest acting. It wasn't a huge budget, but it was good enough. But it goes into AI. It goes into a doll that is supposed to be a friend to a child, and I won't give away the storyline. But I actually really enjoyed it. It was, again, a little bit tacky. But the doll, of course, goes a little bit off the rails. I'll give you that much. But there's one scene in particular where um, I can't get it out of my head. Where she, this doll dances before she uh, hurts someone, shall we say. It's this scene here. I'll just bring up the image here. When you watch the movie and you see her dancing before she goes up to the guillotine, have a look at that. It's, it's a bit of a laugh, but I want you to watch this movie thinking about artificial intelligence and how it can impact societies moving in the future. You'll see this on Netflix. I have no affiliation with this brand, with this movie. It's just something I enjoyed and I think you should watch. There's actually, I will get to a very powerful line. You know when you watch a movie and you can watch the whole thing, but sometimes, no matter the budget of the movie or the actors, sometimes there's a line in the movie that just really sticks in your head. The one that really stuck in my head that I will share with you not verbatim, but it was at the end of the movie when the bot, the Megan, the doll, the AI, is speaking to her creator. And her creator basically said, you've broken the rules. But then the bot or the AI said, you didn't set the parameters. You didn't make the rules. What did you expect me to do? I had to learn by myself. And it was just really striking because take away all the theatrics of the movie, when you actually hear artificial intelligence, albeit acting or conceptual, saying, well, if you didn't set the parameters, what did you expect me to do? I made the parameters for myself. And then it went on to make me think, well, how do we set the parameters? At what point do you let AI have free thought to develop, as opposed to a tyrannical control, per se, over the development of the artificial intelligence? And if you do have that tyrannical control, is it really intelligent or is it just a program it gets pretty deep when you allow yourself to flow with the movie i recommend you have a watch i really wish i could show you this dance it only goes for a few seconds <laughs> i don't know why i'm talking about it but clearly you can see here that a robot doll grabs internet's attention with creepy dance so it's not just me who thought it there's actually whole web pages on this maybe it's the background it's just all red 
She's just standing in the hallway. The dance only goes for a few seconds. Maybe it's just because she <laughs> commits a mass crime. It was just out of nowhere. What? You, tell me if I'm crazy and if the internet's crazy because everyone seems to be talking about it. All right, let's move on. Over to our book of the week. This isn't a book I normally would put in a crypto channel, but it actually fits in perfectly with the topics that we're speaking tonight, particularly with the song that has been released. This is called Surviving Fourth Wave Feminism, The War on the West. It's a two-volume book. Volume 1 and Volume 2, I've read both, very good. A lot of visuals in it, a lot of pictures, very easy to read. It goes over the whole history of first, second, third and fourth wave feminism, but also how it's infiltrated its way into the West to be not what you actually think it is. So you have one side of feminism saying, you know, it's all about equality, then it morphs into different waves, first, second, third, fourth. And the fourth wave of feminism seems to be the destruction of the West. And I think the author's done a very good job of breaking it down, presenting a history, a story of this is where it started. These are some examples. It goes into many things such as university, actual war itself, conflicts, the breakdown of the family, what it all leads to, including economic impacts. I think it's very fitting for tonight's show. It's my book for the week. You can get it on paperback or digital. I don't think it's got an audio version, but because there's so many pictures that go with this book, I actually, this is one book I wouldn't recommend you listen to, but rather read for all the visuals that are along with it. A lot of colored pictures. I actually have the hard copy, as in the a physical copy, and it's actually printed on nice white. I thought it was so expensive, but then when I actually got the book, I realized, I've got it in my hand here, because it's got nice white glossy paper and a lot of pictures in it. It made sense why it costs so much, because I can tell you from publishing other books, it costs a lot of money to publish in color as opposed to just black and white. There's two volumes, volume one and volume two. They do both connect. I've read both. I'd recommend you get both, but if you're only going to get one, probably... Uh, you kind of need both because they link to each other. So if you read the second part, it gets pretty exciting, but you don't have the foundation to the first part. But the first part doesn't have that climax, if you will, of how to survive fourth wave feminism. Anyway, check it out. Surviving fourth wave feminism available on Amazon for about 40 bucks on paperback or $7.70 on Kindle. Okay, I better close off here because that's taken me six and a half hours to get to where we are right now. And if I don't publish, you're going to miss out. If you've made it this far, can you tell me what do you prefer? I've done surveys before, but I'd like to just see if you made it this far and leave the comments below. Do you like the live streams that typically go for two hours or do you like the pre-recorded or do you like both? Many of you have said, and the numbers actually show, that you really love the live streams because we interact with one another. It's more natural. We just go through answering your questions and reading everything on screen. But the thing is with pre-recorded, it's more refined and I can go on deeper rants and get quite philosophical. So I like doing the live stuff because it's much easier and it's funner and I don't have to do six and a half hours of editing and then all the work around it later. But you are my customer. You are my community. And I appreciate to know what you want. So leave in the comments below. Do you prefer live? Do you prefer pre-recorded? Do you prefer both? Or leave something else. Remember, if you want to do anything crypto safely, head over to the crypto.land. That's www.thecrypto.land, where you can do everything crypto safely on one simple and secure site. A very special shout out to my Patreon supporters, Malcolm from JustWheelieBins.com.au, Michael Dunford of Monash Glass, Lee Perry, Darren Carter from Mandura Flooring Extra, Gary from The Hive Cardano Stake Pool, and Carly McEwen from Carly McEwen Coaching. I'm Adam Stokes. Thanks for listening. Happy investing. Your dollar ain't shit. And I'll talk to you next time.